Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you very much for having me um, at this panel. Welcome again, everyone, and thank you again for joining our discussion this evening. As we close out the Imam Ali conference, celebrating the spirit of reform, hosted by Maulana Sayyid Jawad Khizwani Group, who continuously aims to provide a platform to American Muslims to advance political, social, economic, and religious goals important to our community. The purpose of this weekend's conference is to create a forum to foster interfaith unity, to understand the importance of participating in our civic and political responsibility, to dispel misgivings about Islam and Muslims, and to help our fellow Americans better understand Islam through the Quran and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his Ahlubayt Alayhi Salam. Once again, special thanks to Sayyid Jawad Khazwani Group, Ummah, Ahlubayt TV, Baron Hotel Group, and 35 other partners and sponsors for organizing this successful global event. And thank Maulana Jawad Khizwini for inviting me to moderate this evening. As we begin tonight's discussion, we celebrate the life and teachings of Imam Ali, a school we should all learn from. During the years of his leadership, his domain extended over 50 countries as per today's map. The Imam did not segregate between the social classes. The Imam was often seen roaming the streets of Kufa like everyone else. We did not need the army to protect him. He did not need the army to protect him. He did not require a showy parade to inform people that he was passing by. In fact, many times, the people who interacted with him did not even recognize him. The Imam used to help them. The Imam used to protect them. One recalls the time when he brought food for a widow and her children and how he played with orphans. The Imam was part of his people. Justice was the corner, cornerstone of his reign and he believed that no one was above from the law, even himself. In fact, the law during the Imam's term did not distinguish between poor and rich, relative or strangers, merchant or farmer. There's a famous story of when a person of the Jewish faith stole Imam Ali's shield. The Imam, despite being the infallible leader who, was, who, has, who had control of the whole nation, did not abuse his power and decided to take him to court. The judge ruled in favor of the Jewish man and the Imam accepted the decision. The man was taken aback by this, that he accepted Islam after seeing the justice of the commander of the faithful. Imam Ali truly excelled in keeping Islam alive, protecting the welfare of the community and spreading justice. And it is incumbent upon us to learn from the examples of our Prophet and Ahlubayt salam. And we should strive hard to reform our situation to do better. In this context, you look in the mirror and ask yourself and see if you are doing this for yourself, your family, your friends, and your community. Let us leave our differences aside and unify together as one group, one ummah as Muslims and strive to galvanize and help in political process, which will yield humongous opportunities for the betterment of the community. Take it from me. I have done this for more than 28 years. Muslims in America are turning the corner and it is your duty to be a part of this fabric for our next generation. We need not look elsewhere to copy that 
we did not look elsewhere, but to copy what our cousins who have treated, un who were treated unfairly with hate and bigotry. They decided to take matters in their own hands instead of complaining and followed the political process by the book to become one of the most powerful groups to control the political agenda. I constantly see videos of unfair treatment to Muslims across the world sent to me. I sympathize with those who are being victimized. We need not ourselves every these messages with other community members if we are doing anything to correct this. Again, look in the mirror and ask what role you are personally playing to help eradicate this ugly behavior against Muslims through the political process. To discuss this and more this evening, we welcome our guest who served as the first United States Special Envoy to the Organization of the Islamic Conference, a 57-nation world body appointed by President George W. Bush. As a U.S. ambassador, he engaged in hard and soft diplomacy, advancing the interests of America, its allies, and building new partnerships while containing America's rivals and keeping constant pressure on religious extremism. Since 2009, he has been an entrepreneur focused on technology and healthcare, additionally drawing his diplomatic international entrepreneurial experience. He speaks and lectures globally. His opinion pieces have been featured in outlets such as The Hill and Austin American Statesman. He has been written about and quoted in publications, including Forbes, The Wall Street Journal, and The Business Journals. I have had the pleasure of knowing this very special Texan for over 30 years. I have enjoyed working closely with him on various community matters and issues at various levels of US government. Please welcome my brother and my lovely friend, the Honorable Ambassador Sarah Cumber. Thank you. Bismillah rahman rahim Thank you, Lutfi Saab, for this generous introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, Lutfi Saab is a lifelong family friend. And in Texas, he's an institution in his own right. I also want to thank Maulana Sayyid Jawad Kazvini for inviting me to this event. I'm honored to be the keynote speaker at the conference of Imam Ali, Spirit of Reform. I feel humble in sharing my thoughts on the most important spiritual and intellectual authority in Islam after Prophet Muhammad. A gifted thinker, Imam Ali, a renowned orator and a heroic warrior. The past two days, I have enjoyed and witnessed presentations by some of the finest intellectuals, orators, ulamas, and talented young panelists who have articulated and shared their profound knowledge on Imam Ali and other life matters. And I want to thank them all. As a former ambassador with an interest in geopolitics and civil society, I have crafted my remarks on the governing principles of Imam Ali and their significance in today's world. Kindly note that I'm speaking in my personal capacity, not representing any government or faith community. I have a granddaughter, seven years old, Malia. And this morning when I told her that I'll be 
doing my keynote, she made this little good luck prayer for me with a little heart in there. So I thought I'll share with you. <laughs> my sisters and brothers, I want to start with one of my favorite sayings attributed to Mom Ali. He said, teach your children things you did not learn when you were their age. For they have been created for a time that is different from your time. Like many of Imam Ali's guidelines, these words contain both outer and inner meanings. The outer meaning here is concise and clear, but the inner meaning, I believe, Murtaza Ali is telling us that tomorrow would be different from today. And while everything we have told you is true, the significance of each pronouncement may not be the same in all times and all places. My friends, the capacity of human mind is vast, but not infinite. It is probably impossible at our human level to speak about what was said to the people of seventh century and demonstrate its application to the people of 21st century. This is the challenge of all those who follow a revealed faith, transposing the words of yesterday to the world of today. This is rather a flowery way to say that all Muslims must do their best in wrestling mortal limitations in extrapolating the words and deeds from Islam's first century to our modern world. My remarks for this conference will ponder on the governing principles of Ali as an Imam and as a Caliph. And they would include human rights, race and gender equality, diversity and pluralism, civil society, access to justice, education, economy, and leadership through service. Now, due to time constraint, I will touch upon only issues of empowerment of women, which is gender equality, education, economy, and civil society. All evidence in Imam Ali's governing principles show us that the central objective of his governing model or his strategy, governing strategy, was simply to improve the quality of life for all people. The letter to Malik al Ashtar is simultaneously a letter from one man to another, a well thought of treatise, not on government, but on the act of governance itself. Now you and I know that Murtaza Ali was a reformer and an activist. He was concerned by the emergence of a new elite within Islam that exploited the weak abuse of power by the strong against the weak deeply offended Imam Ali. Looking at his words, it is impossible to separate Islam from the dignity and protection for the humble and the weak. His emphasis on good governance flow not from top down, but from bottom up. This mirrors Imam Ali's spirituality, emphasizing deeds over rituals and personal com communion more than public piety. Therefore, we will observe most of the world's Sufi tariqas trace spiritual lineage of their traditions through Imam Ali. Now in gender equality, 
and the empowerment of women. Imam Ali showed deep concern for equity. Imam said, he who has a daughter will avail blessings and forgiveness of God. Imam Ali is saying that having a daughter is not just good. She is the blessings from Allah. And he is clear the nurturing of our daughters can be such that they go on into their lives to have role in social, economics, political, and educational spheres. Now we all know that in the last two days, we have, mashallah, seen young ladies exceedingly overperforming on all the panels. Look at the women closer to him, Imam Ali's wife and daughter. They were knowledgeable in matters both spiritual and mundane. He gave great praise to Fatima, Azara the Radiant, his wife, but also his partner in a loving relationship. In the marriage, which some say was divinely ordained, look at the bride born in the Prophet house and the groom born in Kaaba, Allah's home. What a perfect match, mashallah. Talking of education, the Prophet said, I am the city of knowledge and Ali is its gate. That statement can be read many ways, but the emphasis here is that Ali is the gateway to Islam's love of education, learning, and acquiring of knowledge. In Imam Ali's time, the great Islamic institutional, educational institutions such as Al-Azhar were centuries away. Even madrasas were still in nascent state. The family was the primary vehicle for education, framing it as both a duty and the right. Parents have a duty to educate their children and children have right to be educated. Ladies and gentlemen, that leads us nicely into the need of civil society. A modern term coined in the West. Now some in the West and in the Muslim world question whether there is truly a Islamic civil society. I ask what are institutions such as ulama, tribes, guilds, millets, waqfs, and even some Sufi tariqas, if not manifestation of civil society initiative. In commerce and economics, Imam Ali's approach was distinctly different from those of early Muslim leaders and defy easy contemporary categorization. Remember, one of Imam's many titles was Abu al-Yatama, the father of orphans. He prioritized social safety nets for, for protect of poor and vulnerable to, to, with the project to improve their lifestyle. Imam Ali has no problem when it comes to creation of wealth. He would not tolerate profit interfering with the general welfare and prosperity of all people. Ladies and gentlemen, in Islam, creation of wealth is a bounty minus greed, but it is in the distribution of wealth that brings a formidable social responsibility on all of us. The revelation clearly articulates that a person in need has right into your wealth. Ladies and gentlemen, 
these meditations upon Imam Ali remind us how blessed we are to have the Imams. Indeed, we are told that the world could not exist for a moment without the presence of Imam Zaman, who is the proof of God, Hujat Allah. Having dwelled into Imam Ali's word and action of his governance, their guidance in and through the world is as ever present and essential as the air we breathe. Alhamdulillah, our faith traditions have offered us different ways to understanding the Imams. We know aspects of Imam Ali are seen very differently in different parts of the Muslim world. These sometimes acrimonious views serve as shorthand for a faith community that is arguably more divided and polarized than ever. I want to conclude my remarks with the story of Imam Ali and the young man who asked him, what is Tawheed? Now, this was just before the start of the Battle of Camel, also Jamil. People were baffled that this young man would ask this question at a, such a sensitive time. But Imam Ali stopped and answered him, saying that battles happen when education fails. Let me repeat, battles happen when education fails. My professional interests give me cause to study the history of Christianity and other religions. To wrap up my keynote remarks today, I want to take us to a place and time that may seem not a possibility. Yes, I'm talking about Europe in 16th and 17th centuries. In 1519, Martin Luther began the Protestant Reformation, challenging the Catholic Church in a way not experienced in its 1500 years of history. A century later, religious differences had combined with cultural and economic tensions. And by 1618, these tensions and hatred between Christians boiled over into a war unlike anything Europe had ever seen, or honestly, has since. At the end of what is now called 30 years war, 8 million Catholics and Protestants had been murdered, starved, or left to die of disease, all in the name of religion. As a percentage of Europe's then much smaller population, this was worse than both world wars. Parts of Germany lost as much as two thirds of their population. Now peace came not through victory, but through exhaustion. The two sects got tired of fighting and killing each other and their choices were either coexist or death of Christianity, khalas. Ladies and gentlemen, is this starting to sound familiar? Now please mark what I'm about to say. This happened when Christianity was 1600 years old. Today, Islam is 1,468 years old. Muslims too, we all will face that defining choice. We can benefit from Christianity's experience and make the wise choice without suffering the same horrors. 
Muslims must work for a genuine understanding and acceptance of one another. Remember in the revelation, Allah says that there is no compulsion in faith. And Imam Ali has already warned us, battles happen when education fails. Battle happens when education fails. I invite you to please join me at the end of th in a prayer. O oh Allah, let thy peace be on Muhammad, the chosen, and on Ali, the favorite, and on the Imams, the pure, and on the evidence of thy authority, the Lord of age and time, the Imam is Aman. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Sadhus uh, uh, What an enlightening and uh, powerful speech. Thank you so much. We uh, appreciate your insights and are so lucky to have you representing our community. Thank you very much. I have some questions. Actually, there are abundant questions coming through. Uh, looks like people are watching you everywhere across the world, but I can, uh, we have time only for limited questions. So I have started selecting. The first question I would like to pose um, that has been submitted here is, can you share with us the role you played at OIC? Well, thank you for asking that question, as we are all aware that the OIC stands for the organization of the Islamic Conference. OIC is the second largest NGO non-governmental organization after the United Nations. Now, United Nations has over 190 members and OIC has 57 members. OIC also has what we call observer state status that uh, US, Russia, Canada, and quite a few other European countries sit on OIC with an observer status. The role that I played was that President Bush had appointed me as the very first special envoy to the OIC. And the challenge at that time, Lutfi Saab, was that United States was having tremendous challenges in maintaining relationship or what we were failing to explain to the rest of the world how Muslims are seen in the United States. There was so much noise by special interest group in the media that it was almost becoming impossible to take the message to the Muslim countries saying that America is not at war with Islam. That was the government policy. But unfortunately, as I said, there was so much noise that it was becoming very difficult. In fact, it got to a point where when I would be traveling and I traveled to over 40 countries, to explain our position of the government. And there was a time that we had to bring the leadership of Muslim countries into America, into the White House, at the middle of the night, so that they can spend some time, quality time with the leadership to understand that we were trying, America was trying to deal in a situation where we were not the enemies of Islam. So my role actually was to go ahead and explain where America stands when it comes to our relationship with the Muslim world and the Ummah. Now that also included some of the position or the role or the work that I had to do was also to work with Muslim countries where we had a very sensitive issues in internal wars or external wars. So I was involved also in one of the battles or war going on in Lebanon 
and I was part of the ceasefire uh, negotiations. But these things were always becoming very challenged. So the role was actually to go to the Muslim world and share with them how we Muslims actually live in America, what kind of rights we enjoy. Because I would go and tell them that there are two, at that time we had over 2,000 mosques. And we had over 1.3 or 1.6 million Muslims in America. Rather, not 1.6 million, but 6 million Muslims in America. And how we represent and live our lives. What kind of rights we enjoy here. And that was my role at that time. And it was something that I hope I was successful. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, a very obviously enlightening uh, for people to learn. It's very educational. The second question is, as an immigrant that you have started over 12 startups companies, served as a community leader, and also served at state and federal government level, appointed by the governor and the president of the United States. Can you tell us how you were able to achieve such level of success in such a short time? Well, let this up. Uh, and I have been reflecting on this question uh, on myself. And the deeper that I think and more mature I'm getting in my life, I'm realizing that there was something kind of fear, utter fear of failure, and I just didn't want it to fail. In fact, when I was a kid, I didn't want it to fail my parents. I never wanted to, you know, fail my siblings. I always wanted to be, never wanted to fail my wife or my children, and now my grandchildren. So this sheer fear of failure has always inspired me to make sure that I absolutely do the very best where I can get where I want to. And obviously, when you want to achieve a goal, you have to be very focused. And in my, if you look at my family, we are nine siblings and I'm the baby of the family. So I was always nurtured. I was always harnessed. I was always empowered by my siblings with tremendous amount of confidence in myself. So when I came out in the world, for some reason, I always wanted to be successful and I had to work very hard. Now, something that I need to share with the young people who are listening and watching today, that to achieve the goal in your life, as much as you want to be working very hard, you have to make sure that you have skill sets and knowledge. And somewhere along the line, you take some of the subject matters and you almost become an authority on those subject matters. It may be foreign policy. It could be any domestic policy. It could be race. It could be slavery in America, 400 years of sin that we don't know how to get rid of it. Take a subject matter and become an expert domain. What I call inch wide and mile deep. If you can do a couple of those subject matters and become an authority on that, and then for the purpose of conversation, first was inch, by, inch wide and mile deep, and now it's mile, diet, mile wide and inch deep, which is for the con purpose of conversation, you need to have subject matters where you have some light knowledge. If you walk into a room, it does not matter if you're attending a city council meeting or the school board meeting. If you can walk with that kind of authority and knowledge, everyone would listen to you. They would not just hear you, but they would listen to you. You and I know that there is a difference between hearing and listening but they will listen to you because they will understand and appreciate. That exercise in itself will always open doors for you. You'll be surprised how many times you'll be invited to come 
and talk about the subject matter that you are expert in. The same thing that goes in every part of your life when you want to find success. And I think more than anything else, at the end of the day, our faith traditions always teach us that you have to be thankful, that you have been blessed, and you seek and invoke his grace all the time. And then he protects you and he carries you and you almost have to have that feeling in your heart. Thank you so much. Uh, I can relate to some of the stuff you said, particularly uh, when you mentioned failure is not an option. The Desi generation, when they came to this country, uh, obviously they had to do it. They had to get it done. And uh, we had no option of failure. So I can relate to that. Uh, thank you so much for obviously a uh, very um, educating answer that you have given in terms of uh, how we need to conduct, how we need to work hard. Now, I have a question from one of the participants. David Wallace, the former mayor of Sugarland, worked very closely with you and the Ismaili community to promote peace, harmony, and economic prosperity in our community. Mayor Wallace asks, what can the current leadership do to continue these efforts? If you would like to answer this. Uh, uh, we have one more question after this. Uh, uh, um, I know we are uh, time constrained, but uh, uh, please see if you can answer this. Uh, this is a local question I have incorporated. Thank you. So David, thank you, Mayor Wallace, for joining us this evening. I think uh, the audience needs to know that I am a registered Republican, but I have always been a centrist. I can be to the left slightly or to the right. What we see now in the American political challenge is that before 80s, both parties, the Republican and the Democrats, had conservative and liberals as part of their membership. But since 80s, what has happened is that one party has gone completely to the right and one party has gone completely to the left. So the people like myself who are in the centrist have become, become very challenging. Unfortunately, in the last election cycle, I joined 100 key former national security and diplomats in, in signing that we will be voting for the incoming President Joe Biden as a president of the United States. Now, we know from the last pronouncements from President Biden, the direction they want to go when it comes to dealing with the Muslim communities around the world. And he has been signing quite a large numbers of, uh, I don't know what we call it, um, you know, the president signs these orders, the executive orders. And, he, and, and if you see those executive orders, Mayor Wallace, we are moving in the direction where things will look better when it comes to Ummah living in America. Now, we have to watch what happens in the next two years. The Republican on the right, if they win the election in the next two years in the House, and the House turns to the Republican, and it will be very challenging. Today, I think President Biden, the Democratic Party has the White House, they have a House, and they have a Senate. So I hope President Biden gets enough time to move all the directives that have gone against the Muslims back into where America truly believes that this is a melting pot where everybody comes in 
and becomes part of the society that benefits from every opportunity that we have in America. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we will now um, take the final question. Um, and I have some input in this. Uh, many American Muslims approach the issue of political activism by following the model of the Prophet Muhammad, who established an Islamic community in Medina where there have been none before. In the past two decades, Muslim groups have begun to see political action as one way to spreading the Islamic message and correcting popular misconception about the religion, as well as educating legislators and public officials about Islam and the social, moral, and political concerns of <clears throat> Muslims. The, this education is imperative because of both national and international concerns. At the, at the same time, anti-Muslim sentiment in America is also seen to have a negative impact on foreign policy. Whether in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and elsewhere throughout the world, what are your thoughts on how we can go about educating our legislators and engaging our community on both sides of the aisle? You know, balancing the act, if you will. Lutfi Saab, this is a very deep and, and very important question. Let me break it down in two parts. One is that in America, as much as we believe in capitalism, if you look at FDR and the changes that he brought earlier, almost 70 years back, America can handle. America is a country which is very generous. US aid and other private sectors in America, they distribute almost $350 million a year in what we call an Islamic institution, the waqfs, where this is these dollars or this charity goes out genuinely to help all people. So that way, America is a very generous country. Now, if you see the capitalism and how capitalism is, is instituted and run. Some wise men told me that capitalism is a ruthless way of running the country. But then again, it was in this capitalism that FDR came and gave us social security. It gave us Medicare and Medicare that we have today. So we have people with good hearts. Now, the model that you want to describe in the social governance. And if you go to the Western Europe today, if you go to the Scandinavian countries, Denmark, and all of those countries, they do have that. The challenge is that American model of capitalism would not allow for the government to take away almost 60 or 70% of your earnings to take care of the need of people that are otherwise marginalized. That's one issue, but still we are able to do a lot more than rest of the world when it comes to generosity. But on the other side, we have special interest. We have lobbying. When, when the two kind of uh, parties one is goes on the extreme left and one is goes on the extreme lie, right. What happens in the middle? The middle, we have issues because in the middle, special interest and lobbyists take over. Now, I must share with you something that I have been telling the Muslim, the government, the Muslim majority governments. Whenever I get to see them, 
I tell them that in America, it is your right to come and hire the best lobbyist, the best special group, and they will go and talk to the congressman and your senator. Lutfi Saab, you and I know that in our House of Representatives, every two years you have to run for an office. Now think about a good person, a genuinely nice person who was an activist and who has worked at the school board level, who has worked as a, at the city council level. He or she chooses to run for an election to go to the Congress or the House. She or he wins and gets into the office the very first day. And the chief of staff would come and say, ma'am or sir, at the end of the day, we have to go and meet some people who are going to be supporting you for your next two years. And this congressman is saying, I've just sat in my office and you are asking me to go and see for the next two years? And the answer is yes. If you do not have their support and their dollars, you will never make it for the next two years. They're going to put a candidate and they will put so much funds around him or her that you will be defeated. Our model of government is such, Lufisa, that the day you walk into the office, you are selling your soul. All right, so let's accept that this is the fact of life. Why don't we Muslims go ahead and communicate and work with that model? I promise you, you will change the minds because in America, in capitalist environment, your dollar works. And if we are ready to put our act together and we are solidified together and we become a unit, there is nobody who can stop us. The problem is not with this model. The problem is between within us because we are not together and we are not united. That's the challenge. Thank you so much uh, for the words of wisdom. Um, if we follow your advice, particularly our community that has not engaged, who are sitting on the sidelines, uh, in spite of uh, you know uh, requests uh, from leaders, from local leaders, from our spiritual leaders, uh, those who have sat on the sidelines uh, and not have not participated, I think they need to really take your word seriously and they need to get involved to galvanize. Uh, thank Great. you so much, uh, Sadasab, for uh, joining us uh, today. Uh, since 9-11, an increasing number of American Muslims have chosen to pursue political career at both federal and state level. In 2007, Keith Ellison, the U.S. representative for Minnesota, fifth Minnesota's 5th Congressional District became the first Muslim elected to the Congress. Ellison received much attention when he was sworn in to the U.S. House of Representatives with a Quran that had belonged to President Thomas Jefferson. My friend Ellison served in that role until 2018, at which point he ran for and was elected Minnesota's Attorney General. Andrew Carson, another friend of ours, the U.S. representative for the 7th Congressional Districts of Indiana and an American Muslim was elected in 2008 and was re-elected every two years through 2018. Also in 2018, two Muslim women were elected to Congress, Rashida Tlaib from Michigan and Elhan Omar from Minnesota. Great, great leaders. Many young American Muslims who came of age post 9-11, have begun to take leadership roles in the political sphere to change the image and treatment of American Muslims. Keith Ellison voiced his, uh, he voiced that many American Muslims feel when we explain in 2011 hearings to investigate the 
radicalization of American Muslims. We have seen the consequences of anti-Muslim hate, the best defense against extreme ideologies in social inclusion and civic engagement. Good to know your elected official, stay engaged. They need to know you are their constituent and therefore your opinions matter. Like we have done here in Texas throughout the last uh, couple of decades, our community has been very actively involved. I hope that other states that are not as active will become so. Follow the guidelines of your local leadership, support them in every which way, and get your local elected, uh, uh, local uh, politicians elected with good margins so that they can help and return the favor. So we have a seat at the table. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, uh, Sayed uh, Jawad Khizvini, and all the participants, the sponsors, including the Baron Hotel, for their participation, the Alubay TV for their participation, Oma for their participation. Thank you very much. It couldn't have happened uh, without your support. So please continue to support this engagement. I hope to see next year a live conference. I'm there to support in any which way possible. And with the leaders like Ambassador Sada Kumber, Congressman Al Green, and others who are always there to help us, we will definitely take this to the next level. Thank you so much. God bless you all for listening and joining us uh, tonight. Thank you very much.